Hello everybody and welcome to Practice Makes Faithful. Today we are in Season 3, Episode 3. My name is Ben Patterson, joined by Paul Hugerbar. Uh, yeah, we're here this morning. Ready to rock and roll? Yes, sir. Here we go. Yeah, we are ready to dive into this conversation, continuing with this series, Clay. We started a couple weeks back. Uh, this is one that feels like we've really been building each week. Yeah. Um, and like maybe even more than some of the others, if you are new, if you're just jumping in today, I'd highly recommend go back, check out those first two episodes, uh, because we're going to jump right in today. Yes. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, it is... Uh, we try to, at the beginning of the year, uh, engage in the kind of series that really sets the tone for maybe the rest of the year. And so uh, certainly these stack upon each other. They're not any of them in a sense as you get deeper into them standalones. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think that'll be very evident today in what we talk about. Cool. Well, let's jump in. Paul, yeah. you want to give us a little recap of this series? Yes. So, uh, you know, in the series called Clay, we're asking the question, what's shaping you and we've been making the assertion that um, you know that, that we're all being shaped by something or mm -hmm. uh, at a deeper level the truth is that there are many things shaping us and even you know I've talked about the fact that we're often not aware about what is shaping us mm -hmm. uh, but we have in scripture this this beautiful imagery this kind of metaphor that that we're called to be clay and God is the potter you know we see that uh, Jeremiah talks about that some uh, Isaiah talks about that some. We, we're revert to as clay vessels, um, jars of clay. Uh, you know, in the New Testament as well, uh, God remembering that we are dust, so we're formed out of the dust, so that, that we are something that then is being shaped, hopefully, by God. But the reality for many of us is that, you know, there, there are lots of things leaving an impression upon us, shaping us. Some of those things are out of our control. A lot of that happens when we're young and maybe not even uh, overly conscious of it. Mm -hmm. um, but as we, as we grow older and we start to make the, the choice, I mean, we do start to be able to choose. We, we get to that point where we can choose uh, some of the things that are having a shaping influence upon mm -hmm. us. You know, we even have, have statements that kind of reflect that. You know, you can't, you can't choose what happens to you, but you can choose how you respond. And that's that is, in a sense, reflecting the, the question of shaping. When you choose how you respond, that is uh, the shape that you're taking in response to a certain situation um, or the kind of person you're going to be. And so um, that, that then moves us to the place where we are saying, this can influence me and this is not going to influence me. Well, as Christ followers, more and more we hope that what we're saying is, God, we want you to influence us. We want you to shape us and mold us and form us. And we're saying no to those other things that are trying to shape and mold and yeah, form us, especially yeah. when those things are not of God. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want those things to form us. Now, there are things that I, you know, God uses, and I think we've acknowledged this already. God uses plenty of things to form us, to shape us, um, that maybe he's, he's using as an indirect influence upon mm -hmm, us, mm -hmm. right? But then there are those things that, uh, that, that if we're honest, I mean, you know, we're fighting a spiritual battle daily. Um, so we have other things that are trying to form us with a spiritual purpose. And God also has a spiritual purpose for us. We're primarily spiritual beings living in these, uh, these fleshly bodies uh, for this time, this season that we're on earth. Um, but God has a hope and a desire and a plan for us. We've said, I think, already, you know, think about Ephesians chapter 2, what Paul says, that we are God's workmanship, craftsmanship, piece of art, poem. I mean, whatever language you use to translate that Greek word poema, just the acknowledgement that God is working to make something beautiful out of us. And that's what we hope. But we play a part in that too. And the part that we play in that is mostly whether we choose to allow God to do what he wants to do mm -hmm. or whether maybe even we're at this place where we're oblivious um, and all, this other, uh, all these other influences are working to shape us. So we, we come to that place where we hopefully uh, kind of we grab the reins and then as we grab the reins, the next move is to hand those reins over to God. Um, so again, we're not unaware of what's influencing us anymore. We're now aware. And in that place of awareness, we're wanting to hand those over to God. And so really, I think that's what we're hoping mm -hmm. happens this month as we engage these conversations. Yeah. Um, that we, we cultivate the soul of our lives so that we may be shaped more fully by God. Mm. That's good. So. Awesome. Awesome. So one of the things that we've done kind of 
in this series, or specifically really last week, mm -hmm. was we dove into some different worldviews of the world that may be yes. shaping you, that may be having a formative impact, or I would even go maybe a step further and say that are shaping you yes. in some form. The question is how and how much are you allowing, which of these are having an impact on you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to briefly... I'm just going to briefly go through this list yeah, of these great. eight. We do not have time to talk about them. Right. So uh, I would encourage you to go back, check out last week's podcast where we were able to define each of these a little bit more. That's but right. You got a whole hour of us talking about these yes, last week. Yes. So, so go back and check that out. You'll get, you'll get a lot more uh, detail there. So the first one was individualism, uh, kind of this idea. Like our simple definition around that was that I am at the center of the universe. Yeah. Uh, then we had consumerism, which is kind of this idea that I am what I own. And these definitions you got from this book, Eight Worldviews, right? That's right. Hidden, um, hidden Worldviews, hidden world eight, eight views, cultural yes. stories that shape our lives. That's right. Yeah, so these are kind of their shorthand definitions mm -hmm. for these. Um, then we have the third one was nationalism. Um, my nation under God is this really this idea of putting your nation first. Yes, with the focus it's, of my yes, nation under God. Yes. That's right. Yep. Not anybody else but mine. That's yeah. right. Yep. Then we have moral relativism. There is no absolute truth. So my truth is as valid as your truth. Mm -hmm. Then we go into the fifth one is scientific naturalism, is that only matter matters. Mm -hmm. um, all that matters is science. There's nothing more than that. Uh, then we land to the New Age. Uh, and you had this question on here is, are we gods or are we gods? Do we belong to our creator or yep. are we gods in and of ourselves? Yep. Um, then we go to postmodern tribalism. My tribe, my worldview. This idea that we're identifying in these concrete groups of That's people, right. that there's no really changing from that because you're this, you're also this. That's right. Kind of thing. And then the last one, an odd one, salvation by therapy. The right guidance can help me find freedom. I don't yeah. need God. I just need counseling, the right guidance, and I'll get to That's the right, right place. My counselor is my my priest, my pastor, my yeah. whatever you want to put in the blank on that. Yeah, that's, yep. Yeah. So we spent a while discussing these eight worldviews, but there is a ninth that we didn't discuss. Mm. Um, I'm sure there's more than that, too. But there's one we didn't discuss on that list uh, last week that we want to talk about today, um, and that one is the biblical worldview. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> Paul, what is a biblical worldview? Well, and, and real quick, let's, let's just... Um you know, as we talk about a worldview, I want to make sure again that we are, are defining the idea of what a worldview is first. Um, you know, and a worldview is just it's it's the filter through which you make sense of life, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's the frame framework through which you then view reality. Mm -hmm. So this is how I make sense of life. All the things that happen to me, I'm able to put them through that filter. I'm able to somehow make sense of life, and somehow they're you know, and they're often things that still happen that don't necessarily make sense within our given worldview, but then it becomes also then the framework through which we view reality. So it's how we determine what's true, even if you, you know, going back to the idea of relevant relativism, don't really believe there is objective truth. Um, it's still how you make sense of the world and determine what you think is true, even if you think that somebody else has their own truth and you have your truth, whatever. Um, you know, so, so the worldview, the worldview that you hold is it's the way you process everything that happens around you. Okay, so that's, that's how important the worldview is. And so you know, when we think then of a Christian worldview or a biblical worldview or a Christ-centered worldview, as some would call it, you know, it is a worldview that is first and foremost rooted in the belief that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. Okay, so we're talking about biblical worldview. If we're going to say biblical worldview, well, then it begins with an understanding that the Bible is the Word of God that it's infallible. In other words, it's trustworthy. Mm -hmm. you know, so we can look at the Bible and we can say it is trustworthy, that what Scripture tells us, we go there and we find truth there. In fact, that's kind of the next piece of this. You know, so well, and yeah, in case someone doesn't yeah. know that word infallible, yes. basically is that it is the Bible will not fail. Yeah, it's not right? going to fail. It will not fail that's to right. accomplish its purpose. Yes, so, so God's Word will not come back null and void. I yeah. mean, that's, you know, there's power in the Word of God. It is the Word of God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and so, you know, the belief that, yes, that it is truly infallible in mm -hmm, that sense. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, 
it is then the it's the the foundation and the manner for which the, the Christians view reality. Mm -hmm. It's it's the foundation for how we make sense of the world, mm -hmm. what, how we understand what, then what is true. And so, you know, we would say we, we understand the big foundational truths about life, its meaning and purpose, the, the creation of the world that God created, that God spoke it into being, and mm -hmm. here it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we don't buy into scientific naturalism. It's not that we're anti-science, but we're also definitely not naturalists where we believe that yeah. you know, everything yeah. just happened because it happened. Um, we believe that God is the causal agent behind mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. that happened. You know, it, it gives us our understanding about human nature, about human beings, you know, who we are. It gives us an understanding about who God is at mm -hmm. the heart of that. And so, you know, so then we use Scripture, the words of Scripture, to get us to the place where we understand. So it, it becomes then our filter, just as we say, you know, worldview is a filter through which one makes sense of life, the meaning of life, even understanding life and death and the value of life and other things like that. We do that by understanding the words of Scripture, by understanding that as God's communication to us. God has spoken to us. We want to hear from God. So we go to... Uh, we go to the Bible, we go to Scripture to hear from God, um, and then it shapes, it builds this framework through which we view reality, and all of that coming from the Word of God. And so that is then a biblical, or you might even call Christ-centered worldview. And, and, you know, some people have an issue with putting, uh, with equating the idea of a biblical and Christ-centered worldview. Here's why I don't have an issue doing that. Jesus quoted Scripture often. Quoted the Old Testament plenty of times. And so for Jesus, the words of the Old Testament, what he knew, understood, and had at that point in time as Scripture, obviously the, the New Testament was written um, you know, post-AD 33. And so, uh, so Jesus had lived his life on earth, had ascended to heaven already at that point in time, uh, sitting at the right hand of God. Um, but the Old Testament, he very much viewed as the Word of God. Mm -hmm. You know, and Jesus saying about the words of God, look, I'm not, I'm not living by bread alone, but, but by the word of God, by every mouth that comes from the word of God, that's what I build my life upon. That's what I live on. And so, you know, when we think about this idea of uh, the, the Christian or Christ-centered or biblical worldview, it's important to understand that all of that then uh, comes from an understanding of, of what we gain from Scripture. Therefore, we need to know God's word well. We need to understand these things that are central to, uh, to a biblical worldview. And we need to let that become our framework, our framework for how we view reality mm -hmm. as Christ followers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's, I think that's, a, you know, when we think about what is a biblical worldview, that's, I think that's a basic definition of what is a biblical worldview. Yeah, I mean, and I think many of us would hear that. And probably think, yeah, I mean, that's pretty. Yeah, that's pretty basic. You're you're yes. not going into a lot of doctrinal issues, the little debatable things that people right. question about. Like this is core stuff to our faith. Right? It's rooted in the belief and in the infallibility of the yes. Word of God, and that that is the foundation. Uh, that, uh, it's in the, uh, and it's the foundation for the manner in which yes. Christians view reality. reality. Yeah, and I'll so, just say uh, real quickly too that that a lot of times when these, when biblical worldview is assessed for, and we'll talk about some research mm -hmm, in just mm -hmm. a minute, but a lot of times when questions are asked, they're based off things like some of the very early creeds that we're trying to distill from the Bible some mm -hmm, understandings mm -hmm. about who God is. So, like the Apostles' Creed might might begin with. You know, I believe in God the Father Almighty, so God being Almighty, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But there would be some people who might take issue with that. Well, if you take issue with that, it's very difficult to have a biblical worldview. If you have a hard time believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of Mary, who was a virgin. Well, those are all things that the Bible tells us plainly. Mm -hmm. If you have a hard time agreeing with that, well, then you're going to wrestle with holding a biblical mm -hmm. worldview. Mm -hmm. Because what you're doing is denying, in that sense already, right off the bat, the infallibility of Scripture. Mm -hmm. And maybe mm -hmm. it's because of an influence of another worldview upon you. So anyway, maybe that helps a little bit. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. So I think just what I want to point out, that that's very basic foundational stuff, mm -hmm. I think, for all Christians. Yep. And yet, 
you shared some statistics yesterday that were quite staggering, mm-hmm. um, that were really alarming about how mm-hmm. Christians are living this out and holding to this biblical worldview or really uh, not holding to it in a right. lot of ways. So would you, would you share a little bit about that? Share about those statistics. Yeah, well, you, you know, this is going to be a good podcast when you know we've got research just kind of scattered across the table. If you're watching, uh, <laughs> if you're watching us right now, and maybe I'll just have to rustle it a little bit for those of you who are listening on, uh, <laughs> who are listening as you're driving down the road, so you can see. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, you know, I'll just say this: this this series, actually, the idea for this series. Uh, that we're in right now came about because of the publishing of some research this past summer that I was reading and then trying to dig a little further into research that goes back some of it to 2017 and as I'm reading some of this man just uh, you know there's just the development of this like this pit in my stomach feeling you know Mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. uh, when you read some stuff and it's kind of like it's it gives you that moment of gut check where Yeah. Um, where you had assumed one thing, but then you find out another thing is true. And, and I had heard some research somewhat along these lines, but I think some of the, the most stark and troubling research uh, has, has, been, uh, has been gathered, pulled for the last several years, then published, that data published in the last, uh, last six months or so. So um, some of this research, and we'll, we'll link, um, I'll, I'll link, I've got four different articles here. I'll link them all in the, in the show notes um, so that people can go and read through these for themselves. There's more in here than we'll be able to discuss. Mm-hmm. But some of what we're discussing, the highlights, and then some stuff that we didn't get to ch- chat about in uh, this past Sunday's message as well, we'll dig a little bit deeper. Uh, and then next week, we'll actually come back and reconnect with some of the things we're not able to talk about today as well. But but the first thing that really kind of hit me, you know, and, and, and I'm not too surprised when we talk about, you know, just kind of the, the people in this nation who wouldn't hold to a Christian worldview or who, who don't consider themselves Christians. We've talked about moving to a place where in this nation um, we are post-Christian at this point yeah. in time. We've yeah. talked about that. So when you see the statistics... Um, that really point out, point out that uh, post-Christian people don't hold to a biblical worldview. Well, that's not real surprising. I mean, it's sure, it's disheartening. I mean, we want for people to come to know God, to follow Him. And so, you know, we've often presented statistics like this, you know, in church settings, talking about those people out there. But what these statistics started to point out is something about these people in here, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. us. And that's where really the gut check and, you know, the... the the, almost the stomach cramps and other things come about when you start to see this. And, you know, it, 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 this number, you know, I, Barna says that there are about like 176 billion Christians um, in the United States, uh, million Christians, mm-hmm. 106 billion. That's, I, yeah, <laughs> that would be the moment where we discredited George Barna if he, you know, 106 billion. All right, 176 million Christians in the United States. So about 176 million people claim to be Christians. And a lot of people would say that number is high because that's roughly 69% of the population. And when we look at churchgoers, if we built that number off churchgoers, I think it's somewhere in like the mid-30s who are still churchgoers on a mm-hmm. somewhat mm-hmm. fairly regular basis. And so 69%, we'd say, okay, well, there are a lot of people that call themselves Christians, but maybe it's not really shaping mm-hmm. the choices mm-hmm. they make and the active pieces, you know, the active choices they make in their lives. Um, so what, what kind of shaping influence does it really have? We don't know. Again, we're not here to really... We're not here to judge, just here to share some statistics. But yeah. what comes out of these, this number is that, so we got this percentage of uh, Americans who call themselves Christians, but out of that percentage of Christian, or people who call themselves Christians in the United States, only 9% of those folks who identify as Christians, by some of the standards that we were just talking about, mm-hmm. by the way, actually possess a biblical worldview. Mm. 9%. Oh. Not 10%. Yeah. Not 20%, not mm. 50%, not 90%, 9%. 9%, so an incredibly low number. Yeah. You know, again, yeah. so remember, all we're talking about is this Christ centered or biblical worldview. It's rooted in the belief that the Bible is the infallible Word of God, it's the foundation and, you know, for the manner in which Christians view reality. Um, and then, so how we filter reality, what we believe about this world. So only 9% of people who call themselves Christians actually have mm. a biblical worldview that often just starts with that very simple idea that people would push back on from the beginning that the Bible is the Word of God, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that God inspired 
the writing of the scriptures. Um, that we can believe that the Bible is more than just the writings of people who are having some thoughts about God, that it's actually the thoughts of God about us instead mm -hmm. of the thoughts we have about God, right? Which that's a big thing that you'll see um, that, that's said by people who are drifting from a biblical worldview is that the Bible reflects humans' thoughts about God mm -hmm. instead of the Bible reflecting God's thoughts about us or God's communication to us. It's our communication about what we think we know about God, if there is such thing as a God, right? And so um, maybe a way that we can start to measure, and I asked this question on Sunday, I, I said, okay, if that's true, if only 9% of all people who identify as Christian possess a biblical worldview, well, what would, what would we expect to happen when Christians begin to lose a biblical worldview? Okay. I mean, what would yeah. we expect to see out of that? Well, okay. some of the things that we see out of that, as according to this research, and again, it's research connected with George Barna, with uh, the Arizona Christian uh, University and the Christian Research Center. I think it's a cultural research center there, it's called. Um, and again, we'll post these, we'll connect these in our show notes. But what you see out of that is that you've got, you know, 72% of people who call themselves Christians hold to the belief that people are basically good. Again, that one might present trouble for people, and, and I could see how that's a question that people could get hung up on. When they're looking around, they would say, yeah, I believe most people are basically good people. Got it. But a biblical worldview or an, uh, an understanding of Scripture would, uh, would give us this context that, no, people are, are not basically good. I mean, Romans 3. I mean, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No, we're, nobody's good. No one is righteous. There's none of us that are. Um, and the understanding that people are not basically good moves us to the understanding that people are basically fallen creatures, that human beings are fallen creatures in need of a Redeemer named mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if we believe that we're basically good, then we might also come to the point where we believe we don't really need a Savior, right? And so, um, you know, that leads us to this, you know, 66% say that having faith is all that matters regardless of what faith you have. 64% say that all faiths are of equal value. Well, Back to this kind of, you know, 72% believing that people are basically good gives it, gets us to this place where 58% believe that if a person is good enough, they can earn heaven. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so, you know, it, you can see it, it impacts our personal understanding of the need that we, mm -hmm. we need a Savior. Mm -hmm that we can't be good enough on our own. 57% believe in karma, that what goes around comes around. It's kind of like this cosmic force in the universe where the reality is Jesus says, look, it, the sun shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. The mm -hmm. rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's the reality of this world. Are there consequences? Certainly there are consequences for our actions, but almost this cosmic consequence where you know people who do good get people who do good get good things you know I, we know that's not the reality of life in fact Jesus says we may be persecuted for the sake of righteousness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's that's super trouble uh, problematic if you believe in karma man let's say the whole church believed in karma and then persecution comes along for the church I mean, karma is not a good belief for the persecuted church or for the church that has the potential of being persecuted because then you're going to look around and feel like we must be doing the wrong thing when the reality is that sometimes, according to Jesus, persecution or bad things coming your way can be confirmation of the fact that you're actually doing the right thing. So these, these are diametrically opposed ideas sometimes. You know, what we see as well is that 61% uh, agree with ideas rooted in New Age spirituality. Karma can be one of those mm -hmm. too, by the way. 54% um, resonate with postmodernist views, the idea that there is no absolute truth, there is no mm -hmm. such thing as absolute truth, that your truth is as good as my truth, I make my own you know, meaning and purpose in life, I, you know, all those things. 29% believe in ideas based upon secularism, maybe even sometimes uh, a, a philosophical naturalism um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, these are shocking statistics, really, yeah, when yeah. we look at this truth about, about Christianity. And so uh, some of the things that, they, uh, that come out of these articles that I kind of took some time to piece together, um, 
you know, statements that then these Christians would agree with, that many Christians agreed with, you know, high percentage. A uh, high percentage of those asked in these surveys agreed with this statement, that all people pray to the same God or spirit, no matter what name they use for that spiritual being. Mm. All right, so we're all praying to the same God. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter what name you use. We're all praying to the same thing. So, uh, you know, again, John 14 Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So there's only one way to the Father. Mm -hmm. Now, people might have different variations of how they believe, you know, that all people pray to the same God or Spirit no matter what name they use. But, but if you can't come to the point where you say, no, God is God and Jesus is the way we get to God, then you're going to struggle to hold a biblical yeah. worldview. You're more yeah. influenced by New Age ideas. Yeah. Um, or another very New Age idea, a high percentage of those who said they were Christians agreed with this statement, meaning and purpose come from becoming one with all that is. Right. So instead of, no, we discover our meaning and purpose through what God shares with us through His revelation, we just need to ascend or transcend to this higher plane of being. We become one with all that is. There we will find meaning and purpose, as opposed to, you know, God has told us what the meaning and purpose yeah. of life is. Um, or this next one, which, boy, we can really see this um, coming from the ideas of individualism and consumerism, which oftentimes, by the way, the, you know, the, the North American church has often championed, unfortunately, the ideas of individualism and consumerism mm -hmm. to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or we certainly have not if we haven't championed those ideas, we've definitely not spoken out against those ideas nearly as yeah. much as Scripture does. You know, we, you know, Jesus talks about money more than almost anything else, and mm -hmm. we talk about money relatively little. Um, and I'm guilty of that too. You know, but this idea, and again, a high percentage agreed with this statement. Meaning and purpose come from working hard to earn as much as possible so you can make the most of life. Mm -hmm. High percentage of people agreed with this idea, which is a very postmodern idea. Uh, there's no such thing as objective truth, right? Uh, this comes, this this follows right on the heels of that. Uh, very another very postmodern idea that the idea that what is morally right depends upon your personal beliefs. Again, a high percentage of people um, validated and said yes to that one as well. Um, and 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 I again, at the surface level. I could see where somebody would say, yeah, your, por your personal beliefs, but what we're talking about is moral objectivity yeah. depends upon wh what you feel inside, how you feel inside. So your moral compass is your heart. Okay, well, what happens when somebody else's moral compass is what's in their heart? And what's in their heart, I mean, even if we go and look at a guy like uh, you know, Adolf Hitler, what was in his heart? Mm -hmm. You know, what was in his heart was that it was completely fine to take the lives of a whole lot of people who didn't look like him because the way he looked, even though he didn't look that way, but, you know, his ideal blonde and blue eyed, those are the kind of people that ought to get the best chance at life, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think, again, it just comes back to this idea that we need to be honest that many things are shaping us and mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. always know when things are shaping us. I mean, that's... Um, what's super interesting is you look at this research um, across the board when Christians were asked the question or when pe people who call themselves Christians were asked the question do you hold a biblical worldview a very high percentage said yes I do and then when they start to be asked specific questions only 9% come to actually hold a biblical worldview so you know what what we have known for some time is, is out of that, um, you know, that, that we have a discipleship problem. We can come back and talk about that more in just a bit. Um, what's even more troubling out of some of this research, though, you know, so, so you know, we've known that there's an issue, you know, we in the church have been looking at the world for a while and saying the world is a problem. We're, we've come to that place where we're starting to look at the church and we're saying, man, the church has a problem. Mm -hmm. The church mm -hmm. has a problem. Um, and what I said on Sunday is where I really got that sinking feeling in my stomach was when I moved to the next layer of research, even the next layer of research. Yeah. Because, yeah. I, you know, here I am as a minister trying to lead a church as best as I can, knowing that, man, I know there's so much, that so many influences upon the folks that we're trying to lead. And, and again, as we've talked about before, you know, especially in kind of the, the millennial and Gen X generation, um, and I'm sure for Gen Z as well, 
um, that, that we consume content, especially online media content, at a 20, one, 20 to 1 ratio of you know, content that would lead us away from a biblical worldview to one hour of a content that would lead us toward a biblical worldview. So when, when it's a 20 to 1, 20 to 1 influence uh, in that way, you can imagine the shaping yeah. effect that's going to have on, yeah. on people, you know. And so, yes, we've talked about that before. I think we've got an awareness of that. This piece is what was new for me. Um, so 9% of all people who call themselves Christians actually hold to a biblical worldview. Here's the next bit. Only 30% of vocational ministers, what we would often refer to as pastors, hold a biblical worldview. <clears throat> Only 30% of those who are in vocational full-time ministry yeah. hold a biblical worldview. Yeah. I mean, that, that is shocking to me. And the numbers get even more difficult as you kind of get more granular. I'll, uh, let's see, right here is that, that study. And this, is, uh, this one comes from Arizona Christian University as well. Um, it is actually called New Studies Show Lacking Biblical, Lack of Biblical, Shocking Lack of Biblical Worldview Among American Pastors. And so... Uh, they talk about 30% of, uh, 37%, slightly more than the third, possess a biblical worldview, um, and that the majority actually hold to a hybrid worldview known as syncretism. We'll come back to that in just a second. Um, then they break that down even further among kind of the categories of, of ministers, right? So uh, they say that senior pastors, for instance, um, at 41%, Hold, hold to a biblical worldview that had the highest incidence among any of the five pastoral positions studied. So the next high, highest was 28%, which was among associate pastors. They said one of the more concerning revelations emerging from the research um, worldview, worldview of, of worldview of pastors is the worldview of those who work with young people, Barna noted. The study found that only 12% of children's and youth pastors mm. hold to a biblical worldview. And listen to this. And among those who call themselves teaching pastors, teaching pastors, yeah. the ones who teach, right? The ministers in churches who are responsible yeah. often for teaching. So in teaching environments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we're going, you know, uh, senior or preaching most of the time, then down to teaching pastors is only one better than 12, which is children and youth. It's 13% of those who are teaching wow. actually hold to a biblical worldview. Wow. So when we think about the church having some issues, it's, it's not just folks yeah, sitting yeah. in the seats. It's the folks standing on the stage that have, uh, man, again, it just, uh, it's, it's hard to know. How, well, I know how I feel about this. It's sometimes hard to know what to say about this and to not just get at the point where, you know, we throw our yeah. hands up and say, well, yeah. then what? Then what if this is true? Um, and so... Yeah, I, mean, I just yeah. it's really um, it's really staggering and disturbing mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as you as you go through this as we look at all these things I just find myself wondering thinking like at what point are you no longer even are, are, are some of these folks who would identify themselves as Christians are really no longer even recognizable as a Christian mm. um, at what point is that? That it's gone, like, yeah, maybe they would check the box when they're filling out the survey and say, I'm a Christian, but you would not even recognize mm -hmm. that person. And scarier yet, Jesus wouldn't even recognize yeah. that person. Um, and what just came to my mind in thinking about this is, I, I mean, I think of Matthew 7, where Jesus yeah. says that not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father will enter heaven. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Maybe some would say, didn't we preach in your name? Yes. Didn't we do these things in your name? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Yeah. And that is I, one of the scariest passages in Scripture. And when I read that and I think of these statistics and all these people who might, cr who might check that box yes. and say, I'm a Christian, but their Christianity looks nothing like Scripture. And I don't, I don't mean to say that everyone outside of that 9%, like Jesus has a lot of grace. If you don't fully understand everything, it, it is a journey, right? So there may be some that don't fully understand all of that, but there also seems to be a point with some of these things as we're talking about this where 
are they really a Christian? Yes. Is it just a name that you check? And again, the box? I think I, I think, think probably some would we be. think so because again, as this research points out, just as the other research points out, a high majority of these vocational ministers believe that they hold to a biblical worldview and that they honor the teachings of Scripture by the way they live yeah. and by the views yeah. they hold. You know, so again, it just comes back to this idea that, that we tend to be, I think, unaware or we have, we have yeah. become unaware. We're ignorant of how deeply influenced we are by the ideas of the world around us, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. You know, and so uh, come back to this idea of syncretism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, syncretism is this idea, right? Syncretism is a blending of ideas and values from a variety of a holistic worldviews. This is what the article defines this as. Um, into a unique but inconsistent combination that represents personal preferences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I like and I don't like. I just assemble it all together in this eclectic hodgepodge of here's what I like. I like a little bit of this. I like a little bit of this. I like a little bit of that. And what's interesting is, so, you know, uh, the math is a little fuzzy on this one because, uh, you know, it says 62% hold to a hybrid wor worldview. So I, I bet it's 37 point some odd percent, hold, uh, you know, don't possess a biblical worldview. And 62 point some odd percent, uh, percent, uh, percent hold to um, this, this hybrid worldview, this I'm assembling together the worldview that I'm most comfortable with, uh, mm -hmm. that feels mm -hmm. good to me. And what's so interesting is when you look at the worldviews that many then, or the worldview that many shape, what it ends up being is a blend of this biblical worldview and then individualism, yeah. consumerism, yeah. nationalism, relativism, new ageism, naturalism, et cetera. And it may not be all of those other eight worldviews that we discussed, and there are more worldviews out there than those eight. Those are just the ones that you know, are listed in this book, Hidden Worldviews, and those are the ones that we often live into mm -hmm, and live mm -hmm. out and are hidden, we're unaware of. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at the worldview, if you were try to try to understand the worldview that we then hold for vocational ministers and for people who call themselves Christians, it's, it's not all that different. It is a worldview that then becomes a blend of. Think about the things that uh, you know, many Christians said they agreed with. Yeah, I agree with the idea that, you know, your, your truth is your truth, or I, you know, I agree with the fact that the meaning of life is to get, you know, get as much stuff as you can and really enjoy life out of that. Go live your best life, as, mm -hmm. as is often said. You know, so what we have done and what we can clearly see, uh, we have assembled together uh, the worldviews, a collection of worldviews that have impressed themselves upon us, but what we're left with is not a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. And so your question, I think, is very fair. You know, If we're not left with a biblical worldview, if our lived worldview, which means the way we live, so here come our actions. You know, So our thoughts are first, the way we think about the world comes first, and then we act out of that. Yeah. We act out yeah. of that. So if the way we're acting, the way we're living, um, is, is not consistent with a worldview that would be biblically based, then at what point in time do we have to look at ourselves and say, you know, I'm this percent Christian and I'm this percent an individualist and I'm this percent of a consumerist and what does God want us what want for us? Hmm. He wants he wants us to be wholeheartedly his followers, to love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, to be fully devoted to him. And again, here here's what I want to say. I, I think the reality of this is is that many of us are just unaware. I don't think if, if we had our eyes wide open, we would make the choices that we have made. You yeah. know, as, as yeah. I become more aware, every time a layer of the onion is peeled back for me and I become aware of something that I wasn't aware, it's, it's a moment in which the Holy Spirit says, okay, new level of refinement, new level of, um, you know, the, the fire that needs to burn away and consume some of the things that aren't of God. And so then I have the choice to say yes or no to that. But what I want to do is say yes to that, you know? And so I, I want to believe that of most, uh, at least at least the, the percentage of folks who say, yeah, I'm, I'm an active member of a church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're doing that because they generally want to follow God. Yeah. I, I don't know yeah. about the people who just, you know, say I'm a Christian and it's, you know, still maybe the cultural Christianity thing, yeah. which we know yeah. is on its way out. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality of it is, is, is certainly we have all been influenced by many things. And I think we're many times unaware of the things that are shaping us. 
-hmm. but we need to become aware of the things that are shaping us. And we have a responsibility in, in the church as well to do a better job yeah. than we yeah. have been doing um, in, in the way that we are engaging our folks, to speak more directly and honestly about things, I believe. So you said earlier, and say it again, yep. that the church has a discipleship problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe a bigger one than we want to admit or that we thought was the case. Mm -hmm. What do we do about that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, we, we need to get back to where we're setting the right target. Um, you know, I think for many years, we've talked about this before, we set church membership as the target. You know, if, if you were a member of a church, if your rear end was in a church pew or a church seat in more recent years many times, um, we, we gave you the thumbs up. If yeah. you were at yeah. the building when the building was open, we gave you the thumbs up. Um, mm -hmm. but, but we didn't expect this to really intrude fully into your life. We didn't expect the biblical worldview to become your lived worldview in a mm -hmm. sense. Or maybe we did to some degree, but we were, we were content if you just showed yeah, up yeah. when the building was open. Uh, and so discipleship was not really the target. Mm -hmm. you know, being a disciple of Jesus was not really the target. You know, 1 John 2.6 was not really what we were asking of people, which, you know, 1 John 2.6, I mean, it's this idea that if, if, we, if we claim to be Christians, then we need to live the way Jesus did. I mean, that's our calling, is, is to be like him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's uh, Romans eight twenty nine. you know, can be, be conformed to the image of Jesus. And so I don't know that we set those things as the target nearly as much as we needed to. Yeah, yeah. You know, so discipleship, following Jesus as his disciple, which, you know, we talk about that. We use the, the Real Life Ministries definition. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to follow Jesus, to be changed by Jesus to be committed to the mission of Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now it begins with, again, the on-ramp is to follow. But then what happens out of that? Well, that you allow Jesus to change you yeah. and that you become committed to his mission as well. And so that's what it looks like. How much have we talked about that? How much have we taught toward that? I think that's, that's part of it. So that's maybe the first piece. Um, the second piece, and this is, you know, I mean, if I point at one person, there are four, four? Well, my thumb kind of points forward. So maybe there are three fingers pointing back at me. I don't know. So yeah, the reality is I'm guilty of this as well, is my point. Um, we have often chosen to speak and preach to. So in the moments where we have the chance to influence others, um, things that are more of a feel-good nature than, than the deep truth of Scripture. We mm -hmm. lean into sometimes solely topical preaching instead of actually walking through the whole counsel of God. So how can we expect that people are learning a fully framed biblical worldview yeah. uh, if we have, you know, which, which I've had this yeah. before, a 12-month calendar, and I know when I'm going to talk about, you know, giving or thankfulness, and I know when I'm going to talk about, you know, you fill in the blank. We know we're going to talk about these things based upon mm -hmm. this month because mm -hmm. it kind of coincides with the rhythm of our calendar. Yeah. Um, but what we're not doing is walking through chunks of Scripture in a way that people are, are learning and being exposed to some things that we might not otherwise go to. You know, I mean, if we're walking through a series in 1 Corinthians, man, by the time we get to chapters 5 and 6, we're going to deal with some, some messy questions about sexual ethics that we might avoid yep. otherwise because they're messy. And I get it. No preacher wants to stand up or very few preachers want to stand up on a Sunday morning and topically say, hey, guess what we're going to talk about today? I'm going to make all of you squirm in your seats, and I'm going to make people in the world mad at me because I'm going to say some things that are unpopular. I smiled because we did that last week at youth night. Right, well. <laughs> we were in First Corinthians 5. It was, there it was you a go. wild time. It was a wild time. Uh, you know, but that's the way we get to that. You know, you yeah. guys are doing a topical yeah. series out of First Corinthians right now, mm -hmm. and that's, uh, that's how we have these hard conversations, yeah. but we keep them deeply rooted to Scripture, which... What, what else are we going to do, right? If, we're, if we are, if we embrace a biblical worldview, it starts with the belief that the teachings of Scripture shape and form our lives and should shape and form mm -hmm. our lives because that is one of the ways, not the only way, but it's one of the ways that God deeply forms us mm -hmm. and shapes us. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, one, one thing we've also done in, in, in churches is 
And, and we're, we're not as much guilty of that here, and I'm thankful for that, but I've seen many churches who've just completely eliminated teaching environments altogether. Yeah. You know, so what yeah. you have is a 30 to 40 minute message on Sunday morning, some places shorter, and no teaching environment mm -hmm. whatsoever so that we're shaping new Christ followers helping them understand these things that are central to a biblical worldview. And we're not even talking necessarily about um, like corollary or ancillary doctrine. We're talking about the essential things. So we're not talking about the things that are important. We're ta not talking about the things that are personal. We're talking about the essentials mm -hmm. that form and shape a biblical worldview. And then the importance need to be talked about as well. And we need to have a place where we can discuss things that are personal also. But if we're not, if we don't have environments where we can talk about what the Bible teaches plainly, believing that this is God communicating to us through these written words of Scripture, um, man, we're going to have a really hard time avoiding the discipleship pitfalls that we've been falling headlong into for I don't know for for a while now at this point in time, anyhow. And so, yeah, I think we've had a discipleship problem for longer than many of us would like to admit. Um, but but I'm optimistic. I mean, I, I think I'm seeing a lot of a lot of folks realize this. Um, I yep. think I'm seeing a lot who are not going to realize it. But I think we may reach a threshold at some point in time that in enough churches, enough leaders, and then enough disciples of Jesus, just regular ordinary mm -hmm. disciples mm -hmm. of Jesus, start to teach Scripture plainly. You know, as we say in disciple making movements. Scripture is the curriculum. So we're mm -hmm. getting back to the words and saying, what do I learn about God? What do I learn about people? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. In other words, what, what I've learned about God and people shapes my understanding about God and people, my worldview then, and I'm going to live out of that worldview with the question of how will I be faithful to what I've learned? You know, so I think there is enough, even if it's, and even if it takes some time for that to take root in America, or even if it never takes root here in America, it's happening in other places across the world. And so maybe... Maybe God shifts the center of Christianity or has already let the center of Christianity shift out of this nation to some degree. I hope not. That is not what I want. Mm -hmm. What I want is for God to do a new thing and revive the church here in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we will fall in love with the Word of God all over again. But I know if we don't talk about these difficult stuff, these difficult things, we're just going to go on believing mm -hmm. we're fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything's okay here. Yeah. I can trust every word that comes out of my preacher's mouth. And everybody who says a Christian holds a biblical worldview, but we are learning that's just not true. So as we close today, yeah. how, how can we practice this? How can we practice what we've talked about here to be faithful to Jesus? Yeah, we shared on Sunday morning uh, this story out of Acts chapter 19. Kind of a pretty neat story. You know, we, we know Paul probably spent, the Apostle Paul, Mm -hmm. um, probably spent more time with the church in Ephesus or a longer uh, continuous period of time with the church in Ephesus than he did any other, in any other city. All right, so Paul went to Ephesus, first preached in the synagogue, uh, had some problem with the, the, those who were Jews in the synagogue. In fact, you know, Luke tells us that some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe. They publicly maligned the way of Jesus, which mm -hmm. I, I find so significant that um, that Acts over and over again refers to the church as the way, refers to what Paul was calling people into as the way, mm -hmm. the way of living life. Mm -hmm. So this new way of thinking, new way of being that moves you to a whole new way of living. So it's your lived worldview, mm -hmm. replacing mm -hmm. one with another. They called it the way. There was no question about that. So I, I love that. Um, you know, then Paul moved from there to uh, move to this lecture hall, lecture hall, this guy named Tyrannus. Uh, he spent a couple years there. There was gospel saturation, it sounds like, in the whole province of Asia, which Ephesus is part of, uh, which, is, which is super cool. So a lot of incredible things were happening, miracles through Paul. Uh, there's a crazy story there about some people trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus like Paul was doing, and they weren't really embracing all of Christianity. They just mm -hmm. wanted the power in the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. and they get... Uh, you get whooped by a, a man possessed by a demon kind of crazy story. Um, but after all of that, there is this, in, in Acts 19, verse 18, there's this short little blip at the end of, like, the summary of this story or the landing point of this story talking about uh, many, many people coming to faith and openly confessing 
the name of Jesus, the life they had lived, what they have done. There's a time of confession. And then there's a number of these folks who had been practicing sorcery. Uh, probably Greeks. I don't know. Maybe there were some Jews in that bunch too. Um, they'd been practicing sorcery. And these folks brought together, or they came together. It sounds like they probably must have had a conversation behind closed doors if I'm reading this clearly. They realized their lives needed to change. They realized they'd embraced one worldview, the worldview that is connected with sorcery, the, ab the ability to manipulate uh, you know, through the, through the dark arts in a sense, the spirits, mm -hmm. or maybe they thought of it in the sense of magic, whatever it happened to be. Mm -hmm. These guys said, we need to turn the corner forever on this. So they brought together their scrolls, their sorcery scrolls, which probably had their spells and their other learnings on them. And publicly, they built a, like a funeral pyre with these scrolls. They burned them all. And, and what's so amazing to me is as I read this story, I mean, it's not as if they did this, they made this break with their former life, their former way of living, the things that had been shaping and influencing them at small cost. It was at great cost because you know, those who brought these scrolls together, Luke tells us the total value of these scrolls came to 50,000 drachmas. A drachma is, you know, uh, weighs somewhere between like four and five grams. I think there are almost 30 grams in an ounce. Uh, I think the value of silver is a little more than 20, 25 bucks an ounce. Mm -hmm. So if you were to take that and do all the math on that, um, you're looking at like more than $200,000 in mm -hmm in our world today, mm -hmm. the value of these scrolls that they, get, they brought together and burned. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine us yeah. seeing yeah. something like that happening within our society today? Like all these people, I mean, they could have sold these scrolls. They could have, I mean, there have been so many things that they could have done with them, but they looked at this thing that had been shaping them and they said, it's time to have a funeral for this thing. Yeah. It's time to put it down. It's time to mm. offer it to the flames and I imagine that moment changed them forever. You know, it is this moment in which they realized that they could no longer allow something that was so opposed to God and the worldview that we derive from Scripture to shape them. Yeah. They couldn't do it anymore. And, and so, you know, I think for us, because again, I think many of us have been unaware of how shaped by other things we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think. The question is this, if we're going to be faithful to Jesus, are we willing to do the hard work of, of an authentic self-evaluation, to ask ourselves the hard questions and to try to determine what not of God things are shaping us? I mean, what are those things that are shaping us? Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, here, here's what I want us to do too. I don't want us just to look and say, ah, well, look, it's 69% of all people in the United States call themselves Christians. Of course, a whole bunch of those folks don't hold to a biblical worldview. They don't even go to church. They don't, okay, but there's still a large portion then of people who obviously go to church. If there's more than 30% of Americans who are still church attenders who don't hold a biblical worldview as well. Uh, the research isn't here. I don't know that uh, we could probably figure that out by doing some math on that, but it seems like still a pretty high percentage of people who attend church fairly regularly that probably don't hold to a biblical worldview. So can we look, are we willing to look inside and, and say, it's not just them, it may be me? I mean, we've been doing that with the world for generations, looking at the world and saying, those people out there, but us in here. Um, is it, are we to the place where we're willing to ask the difficult us in here questions? And maybe questions specifically about our own lives what not of God things are shaping me that I am allowing to have uh, leave, leave a real imprint upon me that is forming the person I am and will continue to form the person I will become. And so, you know, I think uh, on, on Sunday morning, I shared just a few statements. I'll recap those again. Um, is it true of me in a sense that I want God to shape me more than anything else? And if that's true of me, am I willing to take the next steps, even the hard ones, so that he can shape me. And I think those are the questions we need to wrestle with. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I want that to be true about me. Mm -hmm. Maybe at a place you're looking at that and you're saying, well, I just want to want that, and that's fine. You know, begin somewhere yeah. with a desire yeah. that moves you toward a deeper desire that yep. hopefully yep. moves you toward action the more you become, begin to desire that. Ask God to help you in this. Yep. 
You're not alone in this. Ask a Christian friend to help you in this. We've mm -hmm. forgotten about the value of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the deep value of relationship and walking this with other believers who are going through the same things but who are setting the same target. Find somebody else to walk this journey with uh, on a regular basis to, that will ask hard questions of you that you can ask hard questions of in return. Um, put yourself in a place to where God has the influence over your life that he deserves as mm -hmm. your creator. Mm -hmm. And so that we start to change these statistics. I think, I think it can happen. Yeah. But yeah. we're gonna have to do some hard work to see it happen. Mm. That's good. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. So I think that's a good good challenge to leave us on. Hope you all take that to heart and mm -hmm. spend some time in reflection this week. Absolutely. Um, and we invite you to join us again next week. Yeah. And we conclude yeah. this series. We'll be in the final part of yes. this. Yeah. And I uh, look forward to hearing how yeah, you land at this some ship more and dive into that. A little bit to the next generation yeah. and how yeah. we become people who shape others. I mean, you definitely don't, don't want to miss that one next week. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you all again. Yeah.